Welcome to another Confluence podcast. I'm Randall Stevens, and as usual, I have Evan joining me. And today, our guest is Carl Vayette. Uh, welcome, Carl. Carl's from uh, a company that many of us have known in the AC industry for many years called New Forma. But Carl is actually a relative newcomer to that team. Uh, his company, BIMTRAC, was acquired back in 2021, and now Carl is running the product show over there. So we're very happy to have you on here, Carl. Happy to be here. Great. Um, so with that, just a little bit queued up, maybe you can give uh, everybody who's not familiar with BIMTRAC a little bit of your background and history, how that came about, and then um, and then you can talk about what this evolution has been uh, with with now that you're part of the New Forma family, um, just where, where you guys are going with the combination of these products. Yeah, great. So um, I guess like, uh, you know, starting, uh, starting from the beginning, um, my background is architecture. So uh, I've, I've worked as a designer in the industry for, for quite, quite some years. Um, and then in 2013, we decided to uh, um, create a company for uh, BIM consulting to help the industry uh, adopt the newest and greatest technology. So uh, BIM1 was uh, developing, you know, add-ons and um, things for um, in improving the life of the people working in, inside BIM and CAD software. So we were developing add-ins for Revit and uh, other different platforms. And then um, on one of the consulting projects we had, uh, we um, we uh, we decided to uh, start developing an issue or an issue management or a task management system uh, fully cloud-based to help with the coordination effort on the project. So uh, this uh, later became BIMTRAC. Uh, so we released BIMTRAC. It was in, I would say, 2016. Uh, um, and then uh, instantly it could attraction all over the globe that people were buying into it and were solving really a, a challenge in terms of uh, uh, workflow and getting issues resolved, not just uh, uh, detected, right? So uh, tying uh, multiple pieces of, of software together uh, Think about uh, Navis Works and and Revit and and then later we added AutoCAD and Civil 3D and a bunch of other different software. So um, that's kind of like uh, you know how, how BIMTRAC uh, was born. And uh, throughout the years between uh, 2016 and all the way to 2021, uh, we had a consistent growth. You know with the platform and um, uh, a lot of customers around the globe uh, leveraging the platform for for BIM coordination, and uh, at some point uh, we had a bigger vision in, in how we can solve problems of the industry, and uh, we decided to uh, join forces with Newforma. So uh, a little bit of history about Newforma. So Newforma uh, has been on the uh, providing solution for the industry for about twenty years now. Um, so we started back in 2004, uh, Manchester Bay's um, software um, uh, editor, right? So uh, a lot of the initial founding team came from uh, from the industry. I wanted to do things differently, build a project delivery platform of the future. Uh, and from 2004 um, all the way to uh, today, um, we managed to grow the platform new from our project center. Um, which is a, an on-prem solution to, I would say, about 17 million projects managed inside the platform today. Um, so that's uh, quite a reach in the industry. Uh, so we were there before many other, uh, you know, software vendors that are now offering, you know, project management, information management uh, solutions. Um, so I would say we're, we basically pioneer the project information management software category. Um, and then when COVID hit in, I would say 2021, right? Um, so uh, there's like a lot of people that are looking for a cloud first, web first alternative, uh, for new from our project center. Um, so we're getting a lot of pressure from our customer base to come up with a solution, right? And that is, uh, one of the reasons why we acquired BIMTRAC, uh, because BIMTRAC was already scaling across the globe. We had data centers in many different regions, a strong platform to build upon uh, for uh, a SaaS-based version of our uh, new form of project center platform. And um, and then uh, we, we shared a similar DNA, if I would say. We're both solving 
issues of the industry uh, in terms of like workflow connectedness, right? How we're connecting different software solutions together and streamlining workflows. Um, so Benchrack was looking at issue uh, issue management, action items. Uh, it had some um, interesting 2D and 3D viewing capabilities also built in a, in a browser, right? And, and then a new former project center uh, comes with a, the depth of functionality for contract administration, file sharing, email management, and, and and much more than that, right? So we needed to find a solution to bring those things into a, a cloud platform. And, and that's what we've been uh, working on since uh, 2021. And uh, just last year uh, in June, we've released uh, New Forma Connect, which is a rebrand of our BIM track platform. And it now includes document control, uh, the 2D, 3D viewing capabilities, uh, BIM coordination, uh, issue tracking, RFI submittals management, uh, email management, file sharing capabilities, connection with various uh, EDMS platforms. So we've got a wide ecosystem of of different connectors now built in, in the solution. So I would say we've probably got the most connected uh, solution to the market. We have over 40 different connectors ranging from AR to VR to out, Outlook emails, you know, and Microsoft SharePoint and uh, and and so on and connecting all the way um to the uh cad and bim software people use to produce drawings and things like that so uh we're, we're trying to be the kind of the master aggregator of project information we're not trying to replace uh the people uh the, to the tools that people use so i like to think about us more of um as a as a central view of the information rather than trying to replicate all the functionalities that all the the software have it in your in your tech stack so um we do that through the connectors with Procore also and and many platforms that uh, uh, we have connecti connectivity built with so with the uh <clears throat> with the bringing together of the two solutions how did you all how did you decide when to migrate um you know existing code or existing functionality versus build something new so like your your new connect was that whole cloth, uh, taking, taking the bib track code now and just, just rebranding or were you actually rewriting parts of that to work better with the, uh, project center functionality? Yeah. So, so that's a really good question. I mean, there's, there's many different angles to it. I mean, at the time of the bib track acquisition, we were, um, actually developing a cloud solution, right? Um, so our efforts had already started. So, um, our new format connect platform uh, currently runs on both Microsoft and AWS. So we've got that multi-cloud backend. Uh, so some of the functionalities run on AWS, some of the functionalities run on, on Microsoft. Everything is um, regionalized, right? Is that, um, is that Carl, so is that mainly from a, uh, a uh, just choices that, you're cut, that the customers are making about which environment that they may already be hosting some of their data, uh, AWS versus Microsoft? Or it, it's really just like a, a go-to-market kind of play, right? Uh, we wanted to go to market as fast as possible. So instead of rewriting everything to make it on, on the same provider, mm -hmm. um, we decided to go to market with um, kind of rebuilding a UI on top of the two development effort that were going on. So it's all unified and connect, kind of connect them together, um, but without kind of necessarily changing uh, the, the cloud providers. So now we're leveraging the best services for the best tasks to execute, I would say, if it's on AWS or if it's on Microsoft, right? So hmm. uh, some of the uh, most exciting development we have going on on AI or on Microsoft uh, for the reasons we all know, right? Um, but uh, that's kind of like our, our go-to. Uh, and uh, of course, we uh, take into consideration everything that uh, relates to uh, data governance and um, I would say data residency, right? So uh, uh, everything uh, remains within the, the country of choice of our customers, even though we're uh, a multi-cloud um, platform. Mm -hmm. And I think I would say like in terms of like IP that uh, we've, I guess, reused from you from our project center, quite an interesting question because like i mean we've got the outlook add-in um that runs on the latest technology built for new from our project center so instead of like starting from scratch we basically fork the code and then we've started from there and then uh evolved it in a slightly di different direction with new from a connect uh because of the nature the speed at which we're moving with the the new platform 
um, and all of that. But um, we've uh, reused quite quite some some of the code and decided to break you know the development path so that we can evolve at different speed. And yeah, that's it. So maybe uh, maybe describe a little bit about what does that what does that team look like? You all brought brought together two um, assuming dev teams came together and uh, arm wrestled over who, whose code was going to win and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what does that look like? What did that look like when you were bringing yeah. stuff together? Well, and it's kind of an interesting story, right? Because you, you think you would think, uh, you know, the the, the large, uh, um, you know, U.S. company that's been there for 20 years, American company, buying company in a very French part of Canada, right, would take over and then uh, let go all, all the the employees, uh, you know, here. And that's not really what happened. It was, a, I think, a really, really good blend and a joint effort in bringing the teams together and then... Um, I think the story on what 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 we're building um, for the industry is and has and is still you know very exciting for for our team and that's why they've stick around and so we grew the team from I think we were about around 60, 60 people into the engineering team and then we grew it we grew it up to one hundred twenty in 18 months uh, um so uh, you know through the acquisition so that's a pretty big achievement and having you know the expertise the cloud expertise we had with bin track mixed with the, the i would say the the legacy knowledge on on the functionalities we've bit, we've built new new former projects and it's it's a really uh, uh good partnership you know we've built you know bringing those expertise together and uh as a result, you know, the speed at which we came up with a new platform and the speed at which we're, we're delivering right now. I mean, there's like dozens of new functionalities rolling out every quarter uh, in the platform. So I think some of our customers have really started to notice the the, the selling uh, speed have increased quite a bit. And so uh, I think it's refreshing for, for a lot of our customers to see that. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, the secret to that, I guess, is uh, transparency with the staff, you know, on the plans and uh, how, you know, uh, they, w which type of opportunities they have, you know, working on the cloud product and pretty proud of the team, you know, the level of collaboration that's been going on and really no pushback on decisions. So uh, um, it's, uh, it's a good, uh, we've got a good synergy going on, I would say, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask before the transition happened i mean it seems like covid really pushed you pushed new forma into this situation right i mean everybody going to work from home we all found ourselves at that point in architecture offices going from an architecture office of you know five offices to 350 offices all of a sudden you know offices of one as it were and really having to collaborate in the cloud and and so i'm just interested from like a external pressure point of view Nuforma was obviously in a position i guess to to make a decision are we going to develop this ourselves or are we going to acquire something that's already baked to some extent and start rolling it out so I, I'm, I'm just interested in kind of the story from that and, and like how that decision was made because i'm sure that they felt pressure to move quickly but then also my question really is around speed and development time because i think a lot of people have feature requests and they have ideas that they things they need software to do and they just take time to do right and they don't magically appear and and so if you could just kind of speak to it from a a time perspective of you know there's this immense pressure all of a sudden we've got to get people working in the cloud we've got to get collaboration happening obviously that's an issue New Forma pre previous to that, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it was pretty much an on-prem solution, like you said. So maybe they're still VPNing in and they're just yep. using it through the inter through the pipes that exist. But, you know, it's not maybe as a, a great of an experience as a cloud-based platform. So maybe you can just talk around that side of things, because I'm, I'm interested as, as a company is making decisions about development and user feedback and external pressure architects are no strangers to external pressure right they're they're the ones usually pushing a firm's technology more from the outside than we are from within in 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 many cases so just curious to hear what what happened yeah well, i think it's interesting because the feedback we used to get prior to covid is 
our customers really like on-prem because they own their data, right? So the sentiment of like owning their actual data and that data residing within their own environment was, I think, the reason why everybody was going for you from a project center. And then when when COVID hit, I guess a bunch of other challenges came up with, with that, right? So uh, VPN access, as you mentioned, right? And people working from home. Uh, having to connect into the solution, having to make sure that uh, there is a secure um, connection uh, to get access to the data, right? Um, and that really, really changed the tone. I mean, at the time, we were already developing a cloud uh, a cloud solution. It was called New Forma Cloud. And uh, we had a, a lighthouse program going on. And some customers were already adopters of that cloud-only, SaaS-only solution, right? Um, but in a, in a clap, just like a finger clap, just like that, you know, COVID hit and then all of that needs to happen at a much faster speed, right? <laughs> so uh, when I say much faster, it's like, uh, we're going to find like, like solutions to replace and we've we got need it now. You know, 12, right. like 12 months kind of thing, right? <laughs> So, uh, um, so there comes, you know, the BIM check acquisition, right? Which is a solution to that. Uh, and then, uh, customers obviously trusted us because they've been trusting us for 20 years. Right. So, uh, they're not just going to change systems just like that. Uh, so when they saw that we started moving at a different speed, uh, we really got confidence that we're going to deliver on the plan that, uh, we've communicated to the customers and. Um, collaboration coming from them, right? On you know what we should build next, how we should build, bra- sh- how we should build it, what we, what we should uh, do different, you know, because we've been doing that for twenty years. The space has changed. Microsoft Teams did not exist back then, right? Uh, now you've got information in many different silos, uh, silos that were not there twenty years ago, right? So maybe there's opportunity for opportunities for more connectors, and so in addition to Deciding to merge new from a cloud development and BIM track, uh, which which was how we got to market so fast with the new platform. Uh, we also got the new ownership. So last last year, at the beginning of the year, uh, we were acquired by Ethos Capital. So with Ethos comes um, a mindset of growth. Uh, so pouring uh, a lot more money into en- engineering, and that's how we kind of scale and evolve the team to uh, to reach uh, you know 120 people on the development team. Um, so that's the biggest development team we've, we've ever had at Uforma. Um, so, uh, uh, that's kind of like, uh, you know, how we, we landed the product and, uh, and now we've got, uh, we've got around, I would say 500 customers, um, on, on Uforma Connect, uh, leveraging the platform from everything that's ranging from contract administration to, uh, file shares, BIM coordination and, uh, and all of that. So, um. I think uh, uh, we're on a really good uh, on a really good trajectory and journey to deliver something that's going to be j- game changing for um, improving the project delivery process uh, of the architects, engineers, and general contractors uh, in the industry. And I think that's interesting also because BIMTrack really had a good mix of architects, engineers, and general contractors that we were kind of serving uh, through the BIM needs, the BIM centric needs, um, and you from a project center was more architects and engineers. So now with this new platform, we're kind of serving the three segments of the industry, which is um, opening up a lot of uh, opportunities for more connected workflows, I would say. There's something that interesting here, and and I think this applies to both of you, because Randall, the work that you've, things that you've said about Avail is like, you don't care where the data is. You, you want people to be able to find it. So the idea of this being a window I think you said that the single source of truth, you're trying to be a window into it, right? So maybe both of you can kind of talk from that perspective because you also mentioned like the tons of silos that do exist that didn't used to exist, but everybody stashes stuff somewhere and they don't always stash it in the same place, right? And so just as a strategy and an approach, how, how do you think about that from a, as a window rather than a, than a repository? Yeah, maybe uh, I'll take a step at that curl and then, get your thoughts, but, you know, from our, from our perspective, um, you know, you can't do everything. And this, these are complicated, um, workflows and a lot, you know, as even as Carl was kind of describing all the different things in that process, it's like, it's hard to be the best at every one of those. So from our standpoint, um, you know, we look at 
because there are going to be some things that we want to be the best in the world at. And then there's a bunch of things then that we just want to support. And there's other best of breed tools that are out there for that. Doesn't mean that you can't use our tools for that, but the recognition is, hey, there's already leaders in those and customers have already chosen those maybe as system of truth around certain parts of their process. So we look, we look at it as let's, let's be really good at certain things and then support, uh, communication and or connection to other best of breed solutions and, and be ultimately a good steward. I would describe it a good steward of the industry of, of not trying to be everything to everybody, be really good at what you do and then support connecting into that ecosystem in a way. So that's the way we think. Yeah. I think uh, it's it's pretty much the same for us too, right? But I think we see an opportunity in the, the cross vendors kind of workflow, right? So each time there's um, a change of ownership in the technology, right? Comes a need for creating uh, company project records for the other parties that are invited in there. Um, and that's the gap we're, we're, we're trying to fill. So uh, an example, I guess, of that in our system, right? And it's a quite obvious one because everybody can relate to that, right? But we've got something to, um, an experience here built that's almost like, I guess I would use a, the open CDE kind of um, terminology there uh, to explain, but we're tying into multiple different data source, right? So we're not syncing the files, like we're not, syncing all the content of your SharePoint in your organization where you may be authoring office, you know, office documents, right? Like Word, Excel, PowerPoint files. Like if an architect is creating, um, is writing specifications on SharePoint, this is where they collaborate. They may have two spec writers working together in there. We're not trying to replace Microsoft, of course, right? Um, same thing for Autodesk, right? This is where your models are going to live, right? Because the models are co-authored, you know, in that location, like, like we're not going to be competing with Autodesk on all of that. But when it comes to sharing, a lot of organizations block external sharing on the SharePoint and they, they, they want to have more advanced retention policies set on the file that they share externally. They want to have more complete history for sharing models outside of Autodesk, right? Um, maybe they're not going to be fine with having the architects and a G the GC working out of the same account because guess what? At the end of the project, your access is revoked, then you're left with nothing, right? You don't have a, a copy of your own data. So we keep like we like the way that we orchestrate, or orchestrate workflow for something as easy as file sharing is that you can tap into any of those locations, you know, on your SharePoint, on your Autodesk account here, you can access, you know, your files and then you can share them from one single location. So you can pick some files that live in different places and then have a full record of, of those files share. We don't know that the files, who have seen them. So when you get into like litigation at the end of the project, you've got full track record of everything, right? Um, so we're kind of creating that, that unified process for people that otherwise struggle. Like, do I share that with Box? Do I share that with SharePoint? Do I share that from my file server over in an email attachment, right? So now everything is unified all together. Um, so that's kind of like the umbrella that we're creating on top of the project. And it doesn't require syncing. It doesn't require changing your tools. It connects with your existing tech stack, which makes it easier from an adoption perspective. Hmm. And we do that, you know, just the same way, right? With uh, action items and, and issues. So when I explore, you know, um, like we've got, you know, those add-ons that live inside the software that people use. Like this is an example with Navisworks where people use Navisworks for clash detection. We're not a clash detection system. We're, we're managing the clashes. We're helping people group and assign them and track them until resolution in a different environment like Revit where those things need to be solved. So we've got the same added in there that lives in there and and in a single click it, we can retrieve the issue locations um so that's kind of the the, the idea of not replacing but integrating with the tools the day-to-day to -day tools that people are using um we're, we're not you know we're not um uh, an email uh an email tool per se right but uh we we create um we create a shared inbox for the project team to collaborate and track items. So 
um, we're not replacing Outlook, we're integrating with Outlook, right? So we've got this new form of connect data in there and you can turn emails into action items that can be tracked and assigned with due date, or you can turn an email into something else, right? An RFI, a submittal and help log the information in the project, makes it, make it searchable and, uh, you know, fast forward those, those, those activities basically. So that's kind of like the idea behind behind not being a single source of truth, but instead providing a view into the information that lives in different repositories, I guess. And this gives you additional insight, I would assume, because you are this umbrella, as you called it, right? And you get to see into all these different things. Does that give you the opportunity to then to create interesting linkages that maybe we haven't seen before? I think you mentioned something about connecting email to BIM, yep. right? Like in the model. And so... Like this is a new thing to me. Like I haven't, I haven't heard of this before. But I, I, to me, you being in the position that you're in affords you the ability to start to implement interesting tool hookups like these. Yeah, exactly. And I think you know, to this point, like we've managed to to find locations in emails and then link those locations with the BIM environment automatically, right? Without any human intervention on this relates to this, right? Mm, um, and when people thought that emails were going away, they're actually not like the projects are getting more complex, no. right? Yeah. There's more stakeholders involved. Um, like uh, emails are, <laughs> are growing. Like I, I saw statistics on emails recently and, uh, it said, you know, an average per person, like, um, go in their inbox. I, I think it's like 20, 20 times a day kind of thing. Right. So, um, You've got disconnect, right? You've got information flowing through the traditional communication channels with project managers and lead architects on projects. And you've got the BIM folks who are working completely independently from that, running their own coordination, right? Possibly both parties are answering the same issues on the project, um, not talking too much with each other because of the, you know, some people may not be tech savvy and able to leverage like open up 3D models and navigate in there. So even though, you know, BIM's a, really, really great <laughs> communication tool, visual communication tool. Uh, if people don't, cannot, cannot access to it and um, um, find, informa find information, contextualize it in the context of other project activities like contract administration, they're not going to benefit from it, right? So mm -hmm. how can we actually, mm -hmm. like we're in a position where we can bring those things together and we can tie, you know, RFIs and submittals and then um, have a more model centric approach to resolving those things, right? What if you could see RFIs and submittals on your model, right? Like, what if like you're, you're, you're about to answer an RFI and then you can just click and see, see it in 3D, right? Um, so, so we, so this is, this is the journey we're on. We're, we're, we're reconnecting some of the project activities, um, so that they, they can be more, uh, design centric in the way that they're getting resolved. Uh, but also taking all the legacy of how contract relationships uh, have been made in the past and still today, right? Um, so uh, that's a um, that's a really, really good, uh, exciting place to be right now because of those um, those legacy uh, information that we've been we've been managing also that can provide insights. And I was talking about the AI um, topic, right? But with all the information we got on those 17 million projects that we manage. Um, we can resurface some some really interesting uh, insights on um, on you know answers for certain of those activities uh, or uh, KPIs uh, for uh, performance you know tracking uh, average time to resolve RFIs in the industry for RFIs and submittals. Um, are you uh, beating the industry standards or are you just are you below right uh, those sort of things? So a bit of benchmarking, but. Uh, most importantly, I think it's a, it's a knowledge management thing that we're providing because you look at the labor shortage uh, that the industry is facing right now, those challenges, population is aging, pe people are retiring, there's a new generation of people that come with no experience, that knowledge transfer needs to happen between the generations and because of all the information that we make searchable, um, I think we play really a, a role into uh, transferring knowledge from um, the older to the, the newer uh, generation, I think. Mm. On the, mm -hmm. back on the email communication, obviously new, you know, new form of, you know, was one of the early called pioneers of, you know, 
tying in and understanding that email was one of the main means of communication in this industry. It's, it's kind of interesting because I, I assume that you're, I would have thought that more communication is happening now, you know, through teams and Slack across these than, than email exchanges, but are you, is that not true or is it, is the, and is the total volume yep. of communication just increasing in general? across projects and is that because the projects are getting larger or what what's driving that yeah i i think uh <laughs> that's a, that's a really interesting question because i think what happened when you think of microsoft teams and the whole scheme of things it's relatively re recent right i think microsoft teams adoption have been propelled because of the covid you know kind of thing again right the remote work and people were doing more video conference and and so one of the cool things that we, we did with, with Microsoft Teams is we built a connector into it because all those communications that are happening after or during the meeting, you know, the comment sure. section in Microsoft Teams, um, and then uh, those communications might be internal, but also internal and external, sure. right? So we might be, you may be an, arch an architect jumping on a call with a GC, right? And there is co conversation in there that could lead to litigation at the end of the project. I always like to say, you know, the last phase of construction project is litigation, right? So you got to get ready for it. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's exactly the problem we solve. So we create an archive of the Microsoft Teams conversation. We index it and we make it searchable. So the day that, you know, the architect's got a litigation going on, they can just search in the system and then it will surface all the search results from emails, RFIs, submittals, conversation, conversation that have happened in Teams, uh, 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 project files, project files content, right? That's our secret sauce. Like we look into project files content and emails attachment content, DXF files, DWG files. Uh, we look into um, uh, DGN files. Uh, so those are some of the CAD file extensions that we support, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint. So we provide more search result than a Microsoft does, or we provide more search result than anybody else does in the industry, right? So that's what, what it, it seems something very basic, like the ability to search through information, but it is a problem that should be top of mind for a lot of people because your tech stack is growing and there is more capital investment in construction right now. So there is more startups coming up, which create additional data silos, right? And, and people are getting frustrated because they can't find the information they're looking for. Hence, I guess the, 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 the additional communications, because there is miscommunication happening in emails, miscommunication happening in teams, what are you using to communicate, right? So maybe the, the answers are getting answered in two locations. So it's duplicated, uh, conversations happening, right? Um, so that, that's kind of like the, I think what I see is, is people don't know which communication child to, to use and that's creating, creating additional communication. As a result, are you, uh, are you, I haven't seen the way that you all have, are presenting this, but are you able to weave, are you able to present the communication like on a time-based manner and weave together all the different communication, I'll use the word styles, whether it was a Zoom call or a team chat or an email exchange, you know, that, that would seem to be the new problem, which is you know, what happened when, right? That's time-based decision processes, yep. <laughs> but you know, I might've sent an email, but then I'm jumping over here in teams and having some other side conversation, maybe even with the same person, uh, you know, uh, but how do you all see that and how's that being managed? What is, and maybe what is the yep. future? What do you, you know, we can talk a little bit, of, where do you think that's going to go? Is that going to, yeah. So I think that's a really interesting uh, topic because we're of course capturing everything as timestamp into our system, right? Like we, we create full project records with audit log. And um, I think like what we, what we've, we've envisioned is, is more of a timeline, as you mentioned, kind of view where you'd be able to slide into a specific moment of the project and um, recall, you know, a specific version of, of uh, a specific view into the project data, that specific yeah, like moment of time. Kind of, yeah. Like, I don't know if you've, um, if you've tried, uh, there, there's a, an interesting website that, uh, I think it's called Wayback Machine, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, the and then you yeah. can yeah. just put any website in there and then go back and have a snapshot of what it looked like sure. back then. Right. Um, so almost like something like that, but for 
for the project data, right? Um, so, so that's kind of like what we had envisioned, but also the ability to tie that into the design, um, the design documents, right? You might think of the drawing set that were available at the time, the models that were, because a lot of the coordination that happened around models now, right? And people make decisions on that, uh, even though um, it, it, it really scares a lot of people, right? <laughs> How much you should trust that versus the construction documents, right. which are the official documents of record, right? Um, so it, it's kind of like tying those 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 three things: the project activities, uh, the design documents, and the BIM environment, and then making it um, making it uh, time based uh, in the way that you navigate through the information. Yeah, kind of fits into Evan. You know, the, these last couple of conversations we've had with people around AI. Uh, you know. Uh, Carl, part of, we've had a couple of conversations around, you know, with AI, you want to basically chew on data to do something with it. And a lot of, the, a lot of it is thought of as kind of the final end product. Whereas we've had a couple of conversations now about, it's interesting to know not what you ended up with, but why you ended up there, which has to do with the process and the communication and the decision-making that was happening. Uh, so it would seem like that that's a really interesting place to start to think about that as you're, as you're capturing the process, you're capturing the, the why, why did we make these decisions? Why were these things done? It's easy kind of in the end to see the end result, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, I think, the root I think as, an, as an architect, that's a huge deal, not from like an accountability standpoint. I mean, of course, it is an accountability kind of a question, but so many times the people who end up using the building are not the people who are involved in the process. And they stay, they're like, why did you do it like this? Because they weren't involved, right? And they weren't at the table. And it's very difficult for us to go back and say, this is exactly how that happened. Here's who made those decisions. Here's why they did what they did, because it's just a constant flow of information, right? And so those those steps, ha and, and I'm not quite sure that I would want all of that documented. Like, it's just kind of too fine-grained sure. at some level, right? But at the same time, it's like there is a story there. Right. And, and so I could see it being useful on some level, I mean, at least, you know, theoretically. Yeah, but it's powerful because it's why we started doing this podcast. We wanted to hear the, the why did you, the why did you go, yeah. why did you develop right. your software in this way? And people like stories and people remember yeah. stories and people like to retell stories. So I think, you know, in the same, mm -hmm. you know, in that vein about a building, it's like, if somebody knew why it was done, it may now not be uh, something they want to complain about. It may be now a story they want to explain and point out to the next person. You know why that ended up like that? Because here was the backstory, right? right. And uh, those are become yeah. interesting data points, right? Yeah. I think it's really interesting to kind of think about this um, coordination of the silos that you're talking about, right? Because I think people still do think about BIM as a lane and email as a lane of communication. And oftentimes those are different users to your earlier point. You've got, you know, the BIM technicians doing BIM things over here, and then you maybe have project managers and team leaders or, or executives or principals kind of making decisions and they're not talking to each other very well. And so the idea of coordinating these different lanes, I think is really, really intriguing so that there is insight during the decision-making process that, that creates the connections between those in a much stronger way. I think that could absolutely be seen as like, yeah, we want that because like you said, multiple people could be making different decisions at the same time about the same thing. And then the confusion abounds. Yeah. And I think it's a good segue into one of the functionalities we have in Connect because back back then, I think we developed this functionality for exactly that. Like we saw, you know, like we're starting from, a, you know, with BIM track back in the days from a, a BIM centric view on things, right? Like BIM coordination, everything was 3D, right? And then we realized like, okay, well, these guys are working completely disconnected from from the rest of the team and we need the expertise of both parties to you know to make good coordination on projects like happen right so so one of the things that we've added in there is the ability to see 2d drawings and we said you know why not 
making those two things compatible, right? And so that's that's what's commonly called now hyper modeling in the industry, right? So it's the ability to see 2D and 3D at the same time. So you can see you know, grid lines in the 3D model. You can see discrepancies between drawings and 3D models, with, which I guess are, are still happening these days because you know, you've got subs that produce drawings and then you've got design intent models. And then when you overlap the two of those and you realize things may be off, right? So, uh, but most importantly, like creating a visual for, for people to align and no matter, you know, if, if you've got the skill set navigate 3D or not, everything is compatible, right? So let's say, you know, someone want to work in 2D, fine. I mean, they can just go there, turn on the 3D model, you're in 2D, right? So you're a project manager, fine. You're raising an issue in there, um, but you don't want that issue to be siloed, right? You want it to be part of, of of the old project environment. So when, when, when we're creating issues like that, they're also compatible in 3D, right? So you can say, okay, I'm gonna work up this thing here. Uh, there's an issue with the stairs there, right? I may assign it to someone. And then someone that's working in 3D, right? So I'm just gonna switch to 3D. Um, they're gonna be going here. And then the, they're gonna be working out of the 3D environment only. And then when you look at the issue stairs, um, they're going to be able to see those issues in a 3D environment, right? So you've got this stair issue over here um, and and you can turn on you know, 3D or go back to, to, to do 2D at, at any, any point in time. So I think it was it was quite a, a challenge for, for us to make that work because um, those, those sheets, you know, are kind of published from the BIM environment and inserted like a house of cards inside the 3D environment. Where, where it should fit at the right scale, at the right location. So uh, you have some you know, drawings like uh, elevations, for instance, where you may have two or three different views so that sheet coexists in multiple locations of the 3D model, right? So that was a quite a challenge to build a thing and, um, and uh, we kind of made it work, right? So it really bridged the gap between 2D and 3D, which was the first step. And now we're evolving that into uh, you know, project activities and being able to see those project activities in, in, in any of those uh, different environments, 2D or 3D. I'm curious how you got to this solution. Was this something that users were asking for? Is this something that you thought internally could plug a hole yeah. that exists in the system, a combination of the two, something else? Because I think a lot of software companies go off and build something and then they try to tell everybody how cool it is. Yeah. Right? But then there's the opposite of that, right? Which is we don't build anything until we get enough votes for, or we keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again. And we say, yeah, we're the right people to solve that problem. So where did this, where did this come from? Yeah. So I think it really, it, I think we, we didn't get a specific request on it. I think we were just like, a, you know, a startup that we we're trying to kind of think, think about things differently a little bit right at the time. And um, we were really envisioning a future where 2D and 3D are interconnected, right? Because there is information. We just realized that from our perspective, the industry is not going to be moving away from 2D anytime soon, right? Uh, I mean, as much as I would, I would like to see it, it's just like the manufacturing space, I don't think we're there yet. And it's probably not going to be there the next, the next 10 years. So I don't want to be pessimistic, but so we said, okay, it's worth investing into it, right? It's worth, it's worth investing into connecting those two things so that we don't end up with a bunch of drawings that have markups on it. Those are actual items possibly, right? And then a bunch of mm -hmm. 3D specific, you know, coordination tasks that happen in clash ejection software. And then you've got two different lists of, of things to address in the morning when you, you sit in, on your computer and you have to uh, review the, and, re, and address those issues in, in the drawings inside the BIM, the BIM software, right? So we were like, okay, what if we can connect those two things, have a unified list of, of action items and things that need to solve. And, um, and then this way you can have a clear view on the, the state of the project, right? What's the coordination held on the project? Like, the, like, are we making changes at a speed that the, the rest of the team cannot keep up, you know, with, with addressing those changes? Uh, and the issues that it creates, what's the state of the, of the project? Like we're going out for, a construction next week, right? Like, have I if I finished to solve like all the uh, the issues, the coordination issues between um, the uh, MVP, MVP consultant and a structural engineer? Um, is there anything pending, right? So you can't answer that efficiently if you don't have everything tied together. 
you know, it's, it's always that question. I don't, I don't think it's either one or the other. I think sometimes yeah. you have to do a little bit of both. You have to listen to the customers, you know, I always describe it as trying to get to the essence of what they're telling you, <laughs> like, which usually requires somebody, you know, like I'm sure Curl is very good at about okay, I heard you say this, let me ask you, you know, five more questions to kind of dig and find out the essence of what their problem is. And then, uh, and then a little bit of uh, healthy reimagining some things and putting enough out there, sure. I call it, let it, you got to do enough to let people punch at it. Like I want to get some feedback on this. Is this a good idea or not? <laughs> and then that's a, uh, you know, as you said, a good, a good startup or an entrepreneurial thinking around that is usually, hey. We've got some ideas. I'm not going to go too far before I put this in front of you and get some feedback if it's a good direction or not. And, uh, but usually it's some healthy combination of those two. It's never one or the other. It's like kind of live in this constant, it's a constant struggle <laughs> when you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this obvious, this has seemed inevitable to me, it, but you can only really see that once you've seen it, I think, because again, this is another lane of communication you know you've got typically somebody much older and more experienced was what i mean by that right doing red lines on pdfs or prints or whatever and there's the time that it takes to do that process and it's happening over there while you've got this continued you know whittling away on the model and you've got email and it's like you've you've got to bring all these things way closer together and decisions need to be informed across all of the layers so this cross section if you will right of all of the different lanes of information having to talk to each other just makes a ton of sense i'm curious from like a user's perspective um i'm sure you get good feedback from this but i'm also curious about uh implement implementing new tech like this and how hard adoption is or isn't for, for this kind of a tool. Because adoption, you know, my experience, adoption's really hard in an architectural office. And I'm sure it's a little different in an engineering office and it's a little different in a contracting office. So talk about adoption when it comes to new tools like these and, and what you're experiencing. Yeah, that's a, a really good topic actually because we would be tempted to think that, you know, architects, engineers, and, and GCs, you know, implement technologies pretty much the same way. But the the way that the procurement process works, uh, you know, with GCs, it's project-based, right? And they adopt technology on a project basis. So um, the, we've seen some GCs. It's, it's quite interesting because um, the... They, they've become really, really good. It's it's almost like um, training, right? Like, I mean, uh, like, like like going to the gym, right? And exercise, like the more you the more you train, you know, the, the, the easier it is uh, to get into it. So I, I think um, adopting t new technologies on a project basis for GCs is something that we see at, at quite, a, quite a lot, right? They test out new technologies all the time. Um, and then for architects and engineers, it's, it's really ingrained in their, in, in their process. Like they, I mean, the, <laughs> it's, it's hard to change tools when you've got something like a well oiled machine, if I can say, right. And it's working well, like why would you change and introduce risk and then, you know, potentially affect your margins with that down the road. So the way of thinking like, you know, architects, and engineers, they want to have something that's predictable, right? They, they want to have something that removes the, the risk that they're taking on projects. GCs are looking at a driving efficiency, right? So we're not looking at the right thing. Um, and I guess we, we tried when we built Connect, we tried to keep in mind new from our project center and the workflows and the wayfinding and the experience we had in there. But we were also getting a lot of feedback on, you know, the, the user experience, the UI is getting a little old, right? So we're trying, we're trying to we're trying to reuse the same terminology a little bit, bring it over, revamp it, make it easier from a user experience perspective. And the feedback we're getting is awesome. Like the user experience, it's really, a, I think it's one of the main reasons why we're successful with the adoption of Connect currently, right? Um, a lot of vendors, like they, they put more functionality on, they, they put more effort on the functionality than the experience itself. I think we're putting much more effort on the experience than the actual functionality in, in the current, in the now time frame. So uh, this may change over time, but I think we're trying, we're trying to really remove clicks, you know, and thing makes things really, really efficient. 
um, so that we don't we don't have uh, adoptions bottleneck that comes with uh, this this is glitchy right like this is not working well it does what I want right but it's it, the process to get there is a little hard right so um, I think our our design team has been you know working working relentlessly I would say to make to make things more efficient um, to a, to a point where I've I've never thought we would bring it. <laughs> Talk, talk a little bit about that, Carl, on the team. Do you use, uh, do you have people designated to like UI UX work and, uh, versus, you know, uh, the engineers that are, uh, you know, built, building the actual applications in tech? What does, what does that look like? What does, and what does that process look like for you all? Yep. So we got a, a design team. Uh, there are about, uh, eight people. Um, so, uh, our our UX director there is doing an awesome job. So we they go from you know getting involved in the early user research phase, you know problem framing, to coming up with some early stage prototypes like pixel perfect stuff that people can test. And so we like we usually get in front of our customers with that. Uh, they provide some feedback. You know I like that. I don't like that. This is not exactly what we thought. So before we get them um, get that to the development team where we actually start this to spend the big bucks, you know, building the whole thing, making it robust, and right? What, what uh, tools, we've already done a lot of validation, yeah, what right? tools do you all use? You're using Figma or what do you all use to do that? Yeah. So, uh, we were envisioned customers at some point and because they're uh, shutting down the platform, we've migrated okay. to Figma. Yeah. Uh, so that was a big change we had to go through, uh, I would say in the last, uh, the last 12 months, um, we've used the uh, Zeppelin also a little bit. Um, so for specific things. Um, so those are, I would say the three different pieces of technology we use, but, uh, I would say we're heavily on, on Figma now. Yeah. And then, uh, those mockups, you're, you're putting those in front of the customers. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, we've got, the um, a group of customers that we engage on a regular basis. Uh, they're part of our product advisory board kind of thing. So those are some of our top tier, uh, customers and. Uh, we also got some quarterly business reviews going on with some of the other larger customers that are not on those calls. And usually it would do a big a roadmap presentation, show, show, show some of those prototypes, get some, some feedback on that, readjust, uh, and, uh, you know, build upon that until we, we get to a point where we feel we nailed it and the customers approved. And then we, uh, we can go ahead and, and start developing. Great. And as you all develop, uh, features, do you. Do you all try to aggregate, uh, you know, multiple features and call it a release or are you more on a rolling release cycle, you know, push, push yeah. it out as <laughs> it's done? You know, how do, how do y'all look at that? And, you know, sometimes yeah. it's, uh, it's a I know, you know, whenever you're disrupting anybody's workflow, even if you're improving it, you don't like it. So it's like, kind of like how, what's the frequency of, and how do y'all approach that? Yeah. So uh, you know what it is, right? I mean, uh, you guys are developing software too, but like, I think there's a nature of the two different products we have. So we have one product that's on-prem, right? So the, the release is like, there, there's like versions, you know, going, going on three times a year kind of thing. So, uh, in between that, like we've got an agile process with, you know, iterations and sprints and everything. Um, but, um, on the connect side of things, it's continuous delivery. So there's like new functionalities rolling out in the platform. We announce it through in app, you know, communications and everything. So we're, we're moving much faster because of that and connect and the learning, the learning curve for us is, 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 uh, the cycle is much closer, right? Because we're raising often. So we get immediate feedback. So we don't have time to get in the wrong direction and have to come back. Right. It's, it's almost sense that we're getting feedback as we release and then you know, three weeks after we may be shifting directions, right? So we can, we cannot get lost really with that, uh, too much. So I, I like like the way it works with, with connect from that perspective. And, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's always been, um, like that. I would say with connect, we used to have more like three weeks kind of sprint cycles, uh, we would release every three weeks and, uh, communicate to the customers and you know what's coming up but now we're really turning into uh, a continuous delivery kind of approach and uh, it's been uh, it's been great on the fun. on that front uh do you like with the connect product do you end up are there any features where you uh you know if, if there's a big enough change do you let people kind of stay in the old mode and then offer hey go take a look at this but you don't you know if it's going to disrupt your day 
come back to it yeah. next week, or do you all just kind of try to try to push things, push. try to push? Right? It's like, yeah, I don't think there's a single answer for that, but I think like we like usually we we, we try to give a heads up to customers beforehand when there's a big enough change. So like when, one of the things that's rolling up uh, in next week, like we've got uh, a new connectivity between our uh, viewer technology and the project files. Um, functionality, so we're kind of connecting the the two, so the back end is the same. So it, it's quite a change, and it's 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 kind of like okay, we, for that change to happen, like we we cannot disregard, you know, the, the the customers that are using it separately right now. So we're just gonna keep it as is, and then for the new projects, they're gonna be you know jumping Start on the new mode, the new. right? Uh, so that's an example of how we we manage communication. So an email went out to announce that to the customers, you know, a few weeks before, and get them in the mindset of okay, the new project is going to be working this way. Um, or like our viewer technology, we've rebuilt the whole technology ground up uh, to to be kind of best in class for for the viewer speed. The legacy viewer is still there, so you can switch back and forth. You've probably seen it at the top of the screen, right? Switch back to legacy right. viewer. So. What we're measuring there, we're, we're measuring usage, right? So we've got 80% of the customer now on the, the next generation viewer. So like we know that this can be the default experience. For the 20% remaining, we're still giving access to the old one. When we get to 95%, we're gonna say, you right, know, okay, you know, right. we'll sunset it and uh, right, can maybe the, the last five percent of the users are using a few functionalities in there that are not worth reinventing or you know bringing over in the, the next gen viewer. So, um, so that's kind of like the edge cases, right? Sure. So some of those larger items, but most of the time we will roll out stuff in the platform. We've got some guided tours. Um, there's a, you know, release notes that people can subscribe to. And, and we've got our chat in app that people can ask questions, you know, if, if need be. So, uh, usually that's, uh, that's how we roll yeah. out, you know, uh, the most do you, of the stuff. do you have a, an example that comes to mind of, uh, a feature that you took away, uh, you know, it's like one of the things that I think, uh, people that, that don't develop software, you know, don't necessarily understand is that like, man, once you've introduced it and one person's using it, it's hard, it's, it's hard to ever take yeah. something away, <laughs> but does anything ever come to anything that you, you've worked on the last couple of years come to mind that you've, you took away and, and you had to fight, <laughs> fight to get it, get it taken away. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we do remove stuff on a, on a regular basis, actually. Like, uh, we look at the usage, right? And we've got a, you know, this tracking platform that we use for, you know, understanding you know, what people are using and what they're, what they're not. And, uh, when usually like we get lower than two, three percent usage, like it's a, it's a no brainer each time. Like we would refactor a page, change technology there. Uh, I guess we would look at those usage and then rebuild it without those those smaller uh functionalities sure. uh, i guess uh, sometimes sometimes we think they're not used and then we find out that they are right so uh that's a, as a downside of doing that but um if we don't do that and you know at some point it slows us down right it's sure. just like oh you've got to rebuild like like everything and then it takes forever um so uh yeah, we, we're trying to handpick the the right functionalities when we factor refactor some of the the experience. Yeah, there's a little bit of the uh, strategy of just remove it and see if anybody screams, and then if they scream loud enough, you can go back to work <laughs> on you know. Okay, let's put it back. Yeah, on. we definitely had this one a few times, but <laughs> All right. no, it, it's a it's a real challenge, right? Because every line of code that you end up writing, and if you add something in there, and that kind of goes back to the earlier part of the conversation about how do you decide to make a feature where well, you don't just make it up because if you just make it up and put it in there, somebody's probably going to use it, but that it may not have, you know, there was the 5%, not the 95%. And uh, those become real challenges yeah. as you're doing this. Kind of work. It's always a trade off. Like it's how much time you put on improving the existing versus some building something new. And at some point, the, the, the 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 opportunity value there is is getting much lower right so you've got some more urgent stuff that people want you to yep. work on so sometimes you're kind of forced a little bit to uh you know say okay we 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 got there we got enough then you know let's change directions right then i think you you talk about you know how we're managing stuff with releases i think the way we drive the roadmap is is product it, it's a um, 
it's a thematic driven roadmap, right? So I'm not sure if you've heard about that, but it's it's like we don't we don't do all dress pizza development. What I mean by all dress pizza development is like okay, one day you're working on pepperoni, and then the day after you're working on cheese, right? And then so you're constantly changing directions, right? And you're doing a bit of everything, but you don't really know what the impact is, right? So that's the worst thing in in software engineering, I think, in my mind, in product management, like it, it's it's doing everything the customers are asking without you know, specific directions or thematic to work sure. on. So the way we think about things is we bundle ideas together so that we can have more impact. So we cluster those ideas coming from our ideas portal. We create an initiative. That initiative is about, let's say, coming up with a better contract change management kind of workflow, right? So if if we had taken the, the all dress pizza development kind of approach, like we would have worked work on that while we're work, working on some issue tracking and BIM functionalities, right? Sure. And then it's sparse, right? You've got, you know, slight improvements here and there, but no, nothing really game changing, right? Because you've done it over time and then now you're shifting directions all the time. So your power to, to have an impact when you, you rethink about the thing as a whole is, is much higher than, than if you take, you know, you do that throughout, throughout time with, with other things on the table. So we're trying to have like a focused kind of approach to things. Mm. instead of like and, and that's frustrating because some some users say okay like during three months you're going to be working on something that right, doesn't right, matter right. to me but it does matter to a bunch of other customers mm. right mm-hmm. yeah um so you're not seeing anything coming out from their own perspective um so it's like how you balance you know we make sure everybody's happy but also have it's an impact a good, it's, uh, it's quite a, a challenge it's a good <laughs> uh it's a that's in itself just a good topic uh, you know as you're saying that we kind of take a very thematic you know, kind of view, but, and what, as you were described it, I'm like, we kind of work in, I'll call it major and minor. There's like the major are become these major themes. Like we're going to work uh, in this direction on this thing. That's, that's the major it's, and then there's, you know, there's always cleanup. One of the things that we've done, um, and some of this is just for the health of the, uh, the dev teams too, just so they don't get bored. But, you know, a lot of times we'll work on a major you got heads down and you're going to kind of get that. We call it preview release. We'll get something out where it's now able to be for customers to start kicking the tires. And on the dev side, that's kind of like a time to take a breath. And then we go work on like little minors, like let's go, you know, we had a bunch of people complaining about this or that let's go. And these are things that you can knock out, you know, maybe it's a day where somebody can go attack those. It's also though, from the health of the dev team, the ability to be like, okay, I'm not just diving into something. I get to like take a little breath for a couple of weeks. We're going to knock out a bunch of this mm-hmm. stuff. And that's also a time period then that you're waiting for the feedback to come from what you've pushed out on the major side. And so we've, we've kind of gotten into a cycle of two or three times a year trying to do that. It lets you, oh, we've knocked out those. Cause you know, from a, if, if you looked at your request list or, or what you really want to work on, it's all majors. It's like, these are the big things yep. <laughs> and all the little things will just get pushed, 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 pushed. So you've got to find some room in the middle of those things to kind of uh, go back and do that little cleanup kinds of work. And uh, anyway, yeah. that's the way we've approached it. Cool. I can't help but but think of Google in what your your example of, you know, two or three people still using a product and maybe then you'll, you'll shut it down. Oh, no. Google's like... It's out of here. I'll just kill it. <laughs> <laughs> just millions of people still using something. Kill it. Kill it. <laughs> God. Anyway, well, this was fun. Uh, Carl, any other, any, anything else that you can think of that you want to kind of throw out there that you're doing? Um, what, what, you know, we haven't talked much, you know, everybody's talking AI now. What's the, uh, yep. give us your, give us your five minute take on on how you all are thinking about what's going on on AI, how you all think are either integrating things currently or foresee that impacting what you're doing. Yeah. So I think it's interesting because, you know, I, I look at some people who are doing some very innovative and very in, intriguing and, and uh, impressive things with AI. I think about uh, the guys at Veras. I think they were on your uh, on one of your podcasts recently. I like those guys, right? I mean, uh, I've, I've tried a technology on my own house project and, you know, just photorealistic renders. They're good Canadians too, it's aren't they? Changing. Aren't they, uh, I think, 
Colorado one. Yeah. Colorado yeah. one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think, you know, it's, it's crazy because I remember when I was in architecture, I would stay up all night looking at Photoshop and Autodesk Viz Render, which I was using back then for rendering, and then look at every single line of render and then uh, figure, like, uh, uh, sh shit, like, I've got this, this material there, it's wrong, I have to start all over again, like, and I've got, you know, that to deliver, in, like, tomorrow, right? It, and now it takes, you know, in a snap of fingers like that, you get photorealistic renders with a, with a prompt. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a very impressive, right? I think the way that we think about AI for what we do, because we're a project information management uh, solution provider, right? We think about how we're going to be helping people better manage information. And that's going to be an increasing, it's, it is already a challenge and it's going to increase exponentially because the amount of data is increasing, right? And then the repos are increasing and then everything is all over the place. So I don't know how people that have data governance job like CIOs, but their job is going to get a lot harder. So a lot of, of people are actually looking to consolidate some piece of technology. Some people, they, they just lost control. So we're thinking about how we're going to be helping a them with AI. So AI for us is more a play into a better user experience for searching through information, right? So we're talking about the uh, the ability to look backward, maybe a timeline kind of view, right? And then the information, and um, that's that's I guess one way of of thinking about it. But you know, when you're trying to find the root cause of something, let's say a bridge collapse at the end of the, of a project, right? So that may be litigation, but also you want to find like uh, you know everything that relates to that 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 issue that we we face and that caused that that bridge collapse, right? So um, that's one thing that can only be achieve if you're able to relate information to one another, right? So you, you're able to relate, okay, maybe that, that RFI here, the answer came from that email and then that came from here and there. And currently the way that people do it through our system is manual, right? They, they're gonna have to say, okay, um, this relates to that and then turn this email into an action item. But what if the whole chain could, could be done automatically, right? What if you, when you get your email in your inbox, we find it automatically in the right project because we were able to look at who it's coming from, what's the title, um, you know, of the of the email. We found the project name, the project number, right? And then AI file it into the right project, and it files it into the right project activity, right? It files it into the uh, series of action items. It files it as an RFI, keeps the relationship between the two, and then that RFI became a change order. And then as a result, you know, something happened at the end of the project. There, there's litigation, right? And then you're able to trace back, you know, all of, of the information all the way to the beginning, right? So, so that's an area where we've been building AI is ma maintaining and creating those relationships between things, bringing the model at the center of all the discussion so that we can see what we're talking about. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's one thing. And then the so other from is... That, Carl, just to dig in a little bit on that, do, do you all view, do you... Uh, do you see the the 3D model primarily as a navigation tool in this world of information? I mean, we think about that the model is what's going to produce the drawings, but a lot of it is also, if you're pulling that up, even in the way you were showing that you're connecting other pieces of information into that, is it a, is it, uh, is the 3D model seen as a navigation tool in your old world? Yeah, I, th I, th I think it is like the, the way I like to think about it is that I want to make the data the center of everything, right? So when you think about a, a BIM model, it's it's a file, right? And in a lot of, <laughs> oh, I'm not going to mention any any vendor names here, but there are some vendors that make everything file based, right? We're trying to free um, the data from the file itself and make it universally accessible and searchable. So you could navigate through the data and then, you know, overlap a drawing, overlap a model under like, like almost like layers, basically of information that you can overlap. Um, so, so the way that, that we're doing it right now is, is we're extracting the information from the 3D model, right? And that 3D model was made available at a certain point in time. So it has, it, it has a timestamp. So now we're able to create an history of the design evolution, right? So we can consume that information with the model and then tie it back with specific project activities that have the same time range. 
Um, so that relationship that we can create. So when you're looking at an, an email, for instance, right, there's going to be loca locations mentioned in there. There's going to be uh, um, assets, right? So let's say you're talking about mechanical room uh, um, 403, right? And then you'd be able, you'd be able to click on that and then jump to the model. And that relationship is made by AI. Or if, if you're, you feel comfortable navigating in 3D and you want to see your RFIs and submittals and emails in the 3D model, then you're going to be able to display those also, right? So you can, you can start with the, the model in mind or you can get to the model from the activity that you're interacting with because you want to see, you want to sure. understand what the design looks like. So people are going to have the choice to do both, basically. Yeah, it's like you want to, sometimes you want to think about this as a chronology of, of things, time-based. Other times it's spatially based around the model and or you want to kind of jump jump back and forth between those two efficiently so, yeah yeah it's an interesting thing to think think about complex right <laughs> yep <laughs> what makes this fun <laughs> yep <laughs> and it's shape shape shifting too right you think about the model and the locations of the information like when you're early stage in the project You've got maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say a, a corridor is right here. And then three months after design changing, it's right there. So how do you, how do you maintain the relationship between lo locations and, and other information, right? So that's, I guess, a topic that um, was quite a, a, explored at the Construction Progress Coalition with uh, Nathan Wood a few, year, a few years ago, right? And, uh, you know, the contractor, like, they don't, they don't have the the walls built right so they're referring to locations you know for from you know the edge of the slab or you know possibly a grid line um and then the architect in the office like they've got the you know the model with the full layout of the floor you know display on the screen and now they're referring with locations with room names right so there's miscommunication happening between the parties right so um i think that's an interesting you know challenge in how people communicate with locations um, sometimes, it, you know, maybe buildings, sometimes maybe levels, sometimes maybe grid lines, sometimes maybe rooms. And depending on if you're on the field or in the office, like you, you, you know, your preferred way of communicating things are, are, are different. And that's causing, I think, uh, issues on the project sometimes. Yeah. The, uh, I was just thinking about, you know, you you were talking a few minutes ago about the, uh, just the, the amount of data, uh, you know, just keeps increasing. And we were talking about that you know, uh, here just recently. And it's, uh, you know, I think it is just, just so that just to remind everybody, it's like, if you're the numbers that I've heard, you know, it's like doubling, you're doubling the basically volume. And we, uh, we do a bunch of work with a company called Ignite that's on the file system side and they, you know, they can tell you here's how many files are being generated and how much data is being generated. And so a uh, doubling right in 10 years is means you've got more than 500 times the amount of data, if it's doubling every year, it's like, so we forget it's like this oh, exponential, wow. exponential amount of info and data. Um, you know, I'll, I'll want to think about this some more, but you know, I think that, um, just that idea that you've got all these different forms of communication that are coming together. The, the, the other thing, this maybe could be for another, uh, another conversation, but it's like, it kind of seems antithetical because it seems like the, the younger generation doesn't want to talk so much so maybe there's less verbal communication and more maybe there is more uh you know chat uh kind of chatting back and forth because i'm a lot of times i'm like just pick up the damn phone like just call and talk to somebody you will knock this out very quickly instead of all this asynchronous you know kind of communication that goes back and forth but i don't know what what you are seeing from the from that kind of data side is it more asynchronous communication or or are there voice and audio conversations that are being recorded as part of the record as well? Yeah, I, I think I see a lot of chatting and that's one of the reasons, you know, why we, we've, uh, we've been building those Microsoft Teams kind of integration. I think the newer generations are using more this communication approach. There's a, a case for, um, there's a strong case for it because we've got, um, actually it all started with one of our customers' lawyer recommended um, in your format to another uh, potential customer. Um, and the reason for that is because on one of the projects, it's a Canadian customer, and then they had that litigation going on, and then someone did a thumbs up on 
a chat in, my, in, in, in Microsoft Teams. And then that thumbs up was later recognized in court of as course. a yes. yes. And then they were able to save $100,000 on just that. Mm. So, you know, most of the, the firms, they don't think about it because it's a change in how people sure. communicate, but it's creating, it's creating a threat to their, to their business because now you don't have a full project record because it's not project based. It, there's conversation between multiple people. There's chats, you know, all mixed together. You can find the information Different in channels. there. Yeah. So the lack right. of governance around that is causing issues for uh, risk for the customers. Or our voice, you know, a lot of times Zoom calls are being recorded and then trans there's transcription, right? That's happening of all that. Uh, is that also happening with voice calls from customer base that you see? Brother. Yes, I, I've, I think the transcripts, uh, I haven't had a case on the transcript itself, but it's something that we're looking at to uh, expand our backup for Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of customers don't have an internal IT team and they don't think about backing up their Microsoft Teams data, uh, especially the, the SharePoint sites that are getting created behind the, the Microsoft Teams um, you know, channels. Um, so, uh, I don't know what, you I know, guess. I'm just thinking about it, you know, almost everybody now has got to bring your own device, you know, so they've got their phone or whatever they're carrying in their pocket. And if they're making yeah. voice calls off of that, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's, those are probably not being recorded, right? Uh, by and large, you know, so there may still be this synchronous conversations that are going on that there is no record of what that was, unless somebody goes back and puts it into a series of notes or something. and and puts it, puts it on the record, yeah. right? To me. Yeah. I think Microsoft is putting quite a, a lot of time in, in building transcripts and those AI powered, um, meeting minutes and action items that get created with copilot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think those are quite interesting, probably not there yet for, sure. you know, a hundred percent trust kind yeah, of yeah. like uh, stage, but, um, we're definitely looking at not reinventing the wheels. So we're looking at how Microsoft evolved with that and would be expanding the scope of what we back up. And maybe those become additional information that we store into the, the system, those, those meeting minutes, transcriptions and, and, uh, and action items. The, I guess, I guess the AI space is moving so fast. Like I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, in a year from now, like they're much more accurate and people start to believe, to believe what they see in there and trust mm -hmm. it more. And I think that that is a bit of a risk for the industry too, right? Cause like how much do you trust AI versus your own judgment? Um, how far do you, should you go? And I mean, people have a short attention span these days, right? It's no surprise. It's like social media, you've got TikTok, you've got Instagram and you know, people like they consume information so quickly, right? If they have to read a, a whole email that's like three pages long, they're not going to sure. do it. And that's a bit of a problem. Just the subject line. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, along that line, and one, I think it is moving pretty quickly and I think people will, I don't think it'll take that long before they begin trusting it, uh, just because they, they will want to trust it so they can move on with whatever else it is that they're wanting to do instead of dwelling on it. So, but, but I think that's in the year, two year, three year time frame as this stuff progresses. Uh, you know, I think back to, you know, my first touch with Uber. You know, 20, probably it was 20 can go back. It was, I was actually, I can remember when I, the first one I took, cause I was, it was whenever Bill conference was in DC. So it might've been 2014 or 2015. I have to go back and look, but I remember yeah. arriving and we were doing one of those first building content summits and I needed to go to the store and get something to, for the conference. So I took, that was my first Uber. And, uh, but to the, to this context, it's like, that was a weird experience, right? The first time you have those kinds of experience, it's like, this is strange. This is weird, but, Very but different. man, yeah. you know, within a year, I'm sure it was like, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so I think we're, I think, you know, that those experiences and the positive part of those experiences, you know, moved, moved everybody along very quickly. I mean, I can remember my my uh, in-laws, they were like, what, you know, you would get in somebody else's car. It's like, so I always think about these things as risk. It's what you're really asking somebody to do is 
how risky is it for me to trust that? So as you go on that risk continuum, you're going to say, well, trust, but verify. I need two or three more eyes on this. I'm not going to completely trust that, but things that are not that risky down the other end of the spectrum, you're just going to say, all right, I'll move on to the next thing. It'll either, either it doesn't really matter or it'll get caught, right? It's so important in the process. So I think, um, I think that stuff's going to move along pretty quick. Yep. Hmm. Well, great. Well, uh, I took, I took what was supposed to be done 20 minutes ago and turned it into, <laughs> into another part of the conversation, but this stuff's <laughs> fun. You know, this is fun. I'm, I'm actually at the, uh, I'm at the, I'm about halfway through an eight and a half, eight and a half hour podcast from Lex Friedman talking to the Neuralink team. It's like a, it's not one giant interview. It's like a series of interviews, but man, it is so interesting. It's like, I just sat last night and watched like two more hours of it. It's just, these guys are Uber, uber smart and it's fun, you know, to get people like yourself, Carl, on here talking about these things and a little, little glimpse of behind the scenes and, and just a free flowing conversation about these things. So, uh, appreciate you being on.